So uh, welcome to this uh, presentation called uh, Moving the Enterprise to, to Kubernetes <coughs> with uh, some of the lessons learned that we have accumulated working with um, Havsun Net and Elchef Nordic. So who are we? Uh, my name is uh, Fredrik. I have this old username from my time at the university. So that's basically my internet name. <laughs> so you can find me at Twitter and GitHub and Gmail, Fredrikl. Uh, I try to blog a little bit as well at fedorkel.com uh, and I work for just a small consultant company uh, based here in Oslo called Eurum. But before that, I was working at a larger uh, company in, in, uh, in Norway called uh, Kumptas. I'm trying to do enterprise software development, um, still learning. <laughs> I thought we had to have a cool picture, so, uh, or at least he told me so, so I had to put in my FIFA <laughs> picture. So, so my name is Gustav. I work as the extended arm of our um, uh, Azure Kubernetes Service Engineering Group out of uh, Redmond. I'm based in Copenhagen. And sort of what I do on a daily basis is to help uh, customers uh, with Kubernetes application, uh, development, and, and how to get on board uh, Azure and how to run that. Uh, and some of those things that we learned from this project and, and another one that we're working on together, at least for, for the sake of us, uh, we're going to be sharing, like, say, that knowledge today. Yeah, so you're going to... Yep. Jenna? A little bit about what we're going to go to. We're going to start with just um, some bookkeeping, uh, set the, the context, set the stage a little bit uh, to see if it's applicable to, to your scenario as well. Uh, we're going to quickly just get the definition right, uh, oh, from our definition at least, from what Kubernetes is, and whether you not should move at all. I killed my headset. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just continue. Yeah. Uh, we're going to go through the Hofsenet story yep. uh, to get some of the background uh, on why we ended up with this decision that we did, uh, together with the context of the customer. Uh, then we're going to go to the policy security part and the things that we are excited about and working on now, especially with the uh, Airship Nordic. And then we'll ho hopefully have some time for a Q&A uh, in the end. Test, test, test. All right. I'm good? Let me just put it in the hand. So that's me. Next slide. So, so one of the things we're going to be talking about is that Kubernetes is sort of the infrastructure core component. And um, some of the things we're going to go into is that it's not only that we need to focus about when you actually do get application up and running, but it's about, about the whole um, can you still hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically also how do we basically want to schedule stuff? Like how do you want to provision stuff? How do you want to push your code, application, and how do you want to scale it as well? So we're going to be talking about some of those functionalities. But also how should we do authentication and authorization as well? Should we do it on the infrastructure component layer? Should we do it in a code? And there's many ways of doing that, and that's something that we sort of want to uh, summarize today in, in this talk and, and, and give some examples of how uh, Haslund, for example, did this. Um, networking is pretty big as well and, and often in many cases super underestimated. Um, and also if you look at it from, let's say, a classical infrastructure point of view, uh, the way you would usually do networking might not be the way you would do in networking when it comes to, let's say, uh, Kubernetes and, and that uh, sort of way that's set up. Um, containers are a super big topic, um, and it has a lot of components that are moving parts in there, and especially from a security point of view. We're going to be covering all the security aspects of that I've, we think at least that you guys should be thinking about uh, moving into, let's say, a production-ready Kubernetes environment, and have uh, a think about some of those topics that we're going to be talking about there. So, who are you? Uh, you're a developer and tech lead or, or architect, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you have some basic Kubernetes knowledge, so if you're brand new to Kubernetes, this is probably not to talk. And if you are uh, kind of rock star Kubernetes, this is probably not to talk either. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But it's taking from the point of view that the things that uh, Gustav mentioned, the things that uh, we learned only kind of three years that we worked on this, uh, what are you going to think about with bringing kind of huge enterprises over to, to Kubernetes? So there are two customers that I mentioned, uh, just to see if, like I said, uh, if it's applicable to you as well. Uh, the first one is uh, well, the one we're working on now, that's Elchip Nordic. Can be probably all of the Norwegian people know it, but uh, could be said to be kind of the best buy of the Nordics. 
to say a little bit about scale here, they have around 300 microservices that they are currently uh, migrating to Kubernetes. And they're quite big. So they did a $150 million revenue on one day, on, uh, on last Black Friday. So they're pretty dependent to be uh, stable. And that's going to be running on Kubernetes next Black Friday. Yes. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, about half the net. Uh, probably the Norwegians in the audience know half the net, but uh, that's the, uh, the owner and, uh, and the company that uh, operates the regional power grid. It's uh, part government and part uh, private. It's the largest one in Norway, and I think it's the fourth largest one in the Nordic regions as well. Um, they have approximately 720,000 uh, customers. And shouldn't be confused with Hofstrom Ström, which is the provider of electricity. So Hofstrom Net is just uh, the infrastructure part. Um, they have the usual suspects of applications. You have the kind of my page where the customer can administrate their relationship with uh, Hofstrom Net. Uh, you have the um, APIs and iPhone and Android applications for the customer, but also for the uh, real engineers, so to speak, uh, the ones operating the power grid and uh, literally keeping your lights on. But uh, maybe the most uh, uh, famous one in Norway, at least, is, is this new project, or the one they're wrapping up now, which is the automatic BD readings. So this is where the, the government decided that all of the households in Norway should get these automatic meter readings installed. So previously, we'd make a manual meter reading once a month, all of us, right? Uh, but now there's this autonomous agent that are making meter reading once an hour. Uh, and over time, it's going to make four meter readings per hour. And they are sending those meter readings in a service mesh, not to be confused with the Kubernetes service mesh, but um, finding its way to kind of central hub, uh, being aggregated, um, validating and estimating missing values, and then sending it into Startnet. So the cluster in Hofstra Net case needs to be very fast to keep the customers happy uh, for the my page and applications. They need to be re reliable for the, the operators and need to be able to handle a huge amount of data uh, as they're coming in. It's only going to be increasing. Yeah. Uh, so Kubernetes here, the thing I kind of learned on, on the way uh, with working with Kubernetes, that it's a platform. Just as the JVM or the CLR gave us kind of platform where you can create new programming languages and we didn't need to, to write to a specific CPU, now we're getting um, a platform on the kind of higher level of abstraction where you can do deployment, the scaling, and managing of your applications. And the kind of all of the lessons from the, the Borg project from Google, for example, are embedded in that project as well. Uh, and since it's a platform, all this cool technology on top of it is coming as well because of this uniform layer. And the thing that is important here uh, that I mentioned on our homepage is the distributed platform for building uh, distributed applications. And the key here is the distributed platform for building distributed applications. That's actually something that was teaching, silently teaching us how to go about uh, creating distributed applications ourselves as well, just looking at how Kubernetes was architected. Uh, another thing to, to mention when you're thinking about moving is, should you move at all? You don't have to use Kubernetes. It's uh, definitely an increase in complexity. So it's kind of missing the point. I've seen scenarios where you, people have spin up Kubernetes cluster and then running WordPress. That's probably a little overkill. Um, it's a lot of moving parts. Um, a lot of things can, can go wrong. So you want to go to a place where the overall um, complexity of your different systems are removed <coughs> from you or moved over to, to Kubernetes here so that the aggregated sum is less for, from what you started with. There are definitely alternatives to Kubernetes. This is just one, Docker Swarm. Uh, you have Mesos, um, you have Service Fabric, but it's becoming quite obvious that Kubernetes is going to be the more or less the de facto standard here. And you don't need to use Kubernetes uh, since you're using containers. You can still containerize and get the kind of um, 
overview and and all of the um, infrastructure handle and still have that run. So this is just one example uh, where they have the uh, Azure Container instance where you can containerize and dockerize the applications and have it running there. And this is sort of a funny slide, maybe a bit inappropriate in some cases. But, but the idea is that if you are brand new to Kubernetes, uh, it can be a bit of a steep learning curve. And that's sort of the why I was sort of hitting it, that you actually go back. But this is also a demonstration of that we see in the industry in general, also from a, a cloud vendor perspective, that we do see that Kubernetes has won the orchestrator wall. Uh, that's without a doubt. Um, the, in general, the, the adoption, we see that uh, basically exploding as well. And we see ramp, uh, a lot of our customers are ramping up uh, quickly. And if they haven't started doing that, uh, they should definitely start doing that now. Uh, Kubernetes has come to stay. Um, but it's also important that you should do it in your pace. It's not for everyone, as, as, as Frederick said before, that uh, it might not even be a solution for, for, for your application that you run and you sit and code yourself. So it might be a mixture of different things as well. So it sort of really depends. So this is sort of a statement to what I typically see working around uh, uh, EMEA region with customers that um, they, they should sort of be careful what they do and be certain about the stuff that we're going to be doing, uh, especially from a security point, which we're going to be talking about at the end of the uh, session. So that's sort of to, to inspire you guys. And Kubernetes is also a, a really good tool, uh, at least we saw it at Tufts.net, that it's kind of bridging the gap uh, forcing developers to be a little bit more uh, thinking a little bit more about how the code is actually running by using the writing the docker files uh, and it could be a good stepping stone to to kind of finally get over to, to doing devops yeah so just a little bit the backstory here on the uh, net so we so we started in approximately august 2016 uh, Kubernetes was uh, one in, in version 1.6.6, missing a lot of the features that we, we know and love now. We had a lot of uh, app services. We were using Azure a lot at Hofstra.net, uh, and we wanted to, to also use the uh, prepaid express route that we had. Uh, and we needed to uh, deploy the, um, the Kubernetes customer custom VNet, because we needed to have control of the uh, CIDR blocks uh, when doing on-prem call, so we did connections with the the custom so unit. The express route is basically just one big MPLS connection to Azure, so you basically have one big van network yeah. to Azure. So what could go wrong here? Uh, <laughs> well, a lot of things. Uh, we were basically learning a lot about the Kubernetes. We were following the getting started guides, uh, but things didn't go wrong right away, uh, as in a lot of cases in the, in our industry that. When you're creating a simple applications, you can probably just use whatever programming language you want or what kind of architecture you want. You're not seeing the pain points, but you're getting pain, pain for those later, definitely. So as the number of applications grew in our case, and also the complexity of each application grew, we were hitting some pain points here. So in July 2017, I was on a summer break had been at this uh, service-oriented architect course by Ude Dahan, which is a great course. Thinking about that, thinking about how we should go about or, uh, architecting our, our uh, solutions to get uh, rid of those pain points. Uh, Kubernetes was hitting 1.7, so it's stabilizing a little bit. Uh, we're seeing some of the features. But the kind of big breakpoint for us was the uh, managed control pane here. So that took a huge amount of uh, load of us. And so the, the uh, control pane would be managed by, um, in our case, in Azure. So this sort of comes to, um, as one of the things I sort of started out with, that uh, Kubernetes is basically just a core component. Um, we can see it, it's, it's, it, we need to have a lot of, let's say, think about how you want to be doing things, um, both from, let's say, a data perspective, one recommendation I typically have to a lot of our customers is that uh, bind the stuff as closely together as you can. That means that if you have any, if you want to be spinning up a Kubernetes cluster, try to have the data on premises, sorry, uh, in Azure as well. Um, preferably on a pass solution in terms of something called Cosmos or even uh, uh, SQL uh, on Azure as well as a pass services. 
it's bringing a lot of advantages, specifically from scale perspective and, and agility and speed. Um, you basically want to dominate the uh, Kubernetes, and, and how you want to be doing that is sort of a, a cool way of bringing all that together. Um, storage is, a, is an interesting one as well. Typically, I would never recommend any customers using any, let's say, attached storage to some spe specific pods or containers running in a Kubernetes environment, unless they really need to do so. And if they need to do so, I would rather prefer that they have a storage solution outside the Kubernetes cluster, so you don't put additional load on the Kubernetes itself. Um, I see customers going with Kafka clusters outside of it, and there's different options as well, like Rook or anything like that. So when we sort of talk about that, um, but there's also the aspect of security and how you want to be doing that. Um, on Azure, there's different ways of doing it, and uh, we have something called Azure Security Center, which actually benefits a lot, and also uh, taking advantage of the cybercrime units uh, intelligence that we have uh, on Azure and, and sort of utilizing that to protect the environments. Another topic is also who's supposed to pay the costs. So when you operate a Kubernetes cluster or, or an application, who and where does the cost go? So one of the cool things about cloud is also the possibility to manage cost and, and the governance amount uh, around the compute stack as well. So that can be hit, given to the different, uh, let's say, division or, or development divisions or IT or, or finance department if it's their application that we're hosting. So there's a lot of cool stuff we want to be doing out there. And least and uh, last is that also how we're going to do and go around with the whole identity platform. I see a majority of our customers comes from a, a Microsoft uh, background as well. So that means that their identity has already been, let's say, pushed out in Azure Active Directory. And that can be utilized in Kubernetes as well, which we're going to be talking about uh, uh, later on as well. So before I spend too much time on this slide, the only f last thing I want to be talking about is, uh, is the stuff that we have here on the left side. Um, especially the CI, uh, CD stuff is super important in here as well. Um, a developer should code. He shouldn't do anything else. He should press F5, he should be done, and then everything should be ported into your pipelines and, sh and being worked there and shot into your Kubernetes cluster. That's sort of the ideal system we want to have. You can use whatever tool you want to do, but emphasizing the need and, 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 and the strength of a, a really cool tool like that is super, super valuable. And we're going to be talking about the rest of the components throughout the presentation. Yeah, so the, the first thing we, we started working on, uh, because the Kubernetes was uh, introducing the functionality, is uh, role-based access control. So there are uh, um, three ways of do, doing it, two ways of doing it. Uh, you have the basic, which is uh, basically, uh, no pun intended, uh, where you have a, a file in your API server, and for each row of the files, that's for each of the developers, you have the username and password and group membership. Uh, you can use the X509 client certificates. So in your uh, control plane on your API server, you are spinning up a certificate authority that you can sign certificates, and then you would embed the username and, and group memberships as part of that certificate. Uh, neither of those two worked really well for us uh, because it's kind of cumbersome if somebody leaves uh, net in our case. Uh, to kind of uh, the rotation of the certificate authority, for example. That's, I know that's something that the Kubernetes community is, is working on now as well. So the, the good thing about the architecture of Kubernetes, one of the, one of the good things here is that they have uh, made a very conscious decision that uh, the users should be outside of Kubernetes. That's why you, you never see a kubectl create user command, for example. Uh, and they're supporting OpenID Connect, so you can use uh, whatever OpenID Connect provided uh, security store that you have. Uh, and we already having all of our developers in Azure uh, Active Directory uh, utilize that. So we used an uh, Azure Active Directory application and uh, connected that into the um, Kubernetes control plane here. Uh, so when the, the developers uh, was moving on to different projects or, uh, or uh, were leaving in general, you can just delete it from Azure Active Directory and never lose their access right to, to the Kubernetes cluster. Just a quick comment to that one. One we typically also see from security uh, folks is that uh, a security officer would like to control if anyone gets, let's say, uh, stopped working at a given uh, company or if 
our credentials has been compromised, that we can easily go in and flip a switch uh, because of these integrations as well. And Fred is going to talk about that in the next one as well. So the, um, the Kubernetes authorization is, um, this is what we ended up doing. So we uh, kind of went from an uh, opt-out approach to an opt-in approach. And by that I mean that previously everybody was admin, which was horrible, which is <laughs> just out of our mind uh, every day at work. Uh, and then we just flipped on the role-based ac access control and started with this cluster role, which has had no access rights. And that just sitting and preparing for a kind of tidal wave of complaints. And then we would take uh, each comp complaint at a time, uh, look at it, and then slowly giving access to, to the correct sets. So this is the developer cluster role that we used in dev and, uh, and test. And obviously the developer role would be a lot more restrictive in production as well. Something that we were struggling about uh, from the, the first try, so to speak, uh, was the encapsulation. How should we go about um, creating your applications and, and systems? And uh, having been in this service-oriented architecture course, we're kind of biased, um, getting a, got a lot of good ideas from there. So we saw that we were missing an enterprise architecture we had a good grasp of their individual applications, doing a lot of good coding for each of the separate applications. But uh, going on, on a higher level of abstraction, we're kind of missing a little bit. And just throwing Kubernetes on won't help. So this is uh, one of the many cases where you can't just throw technology on it. Uh, and we've seen scenarios as well where you just ramp up with a huge amount of applications. You're kind of losing control. And then you're throwing even more technology on with the service mesh, for example. Um, and we definitely wanted to avoid this kind of entity as a microservice. Uh, so on the SAM, uh, SAM talk, for example, we saw the uh, invoicing instead of invoice. So you're having more functionality. Uh, and you don't want to replace uh, table joins with all HTTP requests all over the place. It's kind of expensive compared to table joins. So we used uh, the main driven design uh, together with uh, service-oriented architecture to, to get those boundaries uh, more or less right, or more right. And we have been struggling a lot with this question, well, how large is the microservice? People are kind of hooked on the microservice uh, path, and uh, service-oriented architecture is basically an opinionated microservice strategy. So I was uh, kind of wondering why a lot of the good ideas from SUA got lost and a lot of it replaced with the microservices. But yeah, it is microservices, but with the kind of opinion at the way of looking at it. Uh, and then we went full enterprise here and created our own framework, which is uh, more or less just on the ubiquitous language, because we saw that uh, a lot of times we were talking, um, uh, not knowing the bound of context here. So an information architect would look at things at one viewpoint, whereas a developer, uh, another one, an architect, yet another one. So we um, started to, to, to be um, very specific about how we use the terminology. So this is the viewpoint from service-oriented architecture. So we would basically call technology, programming languages, and, and frameworks. And, and this is where the, the developers would be the majority of the, the work here. So he or she would be making a subset uh, the right or the best choice um, that he or she thinks and create applications. And that applications will have a one-to-one -one relationship. That's our Kubernetes deployments. And service-oriented architecture as having a very sharp separation between system and applications. And they were constantly talking about this. So once, you, once the applications are start talking to each other, or talking to external services, such as uh, Twilio, for example, you're actually talking about the system. And this is where all of the fallacies of distributed computing come into place with uh, unstable networking, for example. Uh, and with this system, uh, we uh, appointed a kind of tech lead for each of them to be responsible for creating the right set of applications and hitting the, the functional and non-functional requirements for each of the systems. And this system uh, naming and way of thinking went through 
uh, the entire organization as well. So we will have one namespace for each system. We'll have one Azure DevOps project for each system. Uh, conference, uh, page, uh, um, a Jira project, etc. And then we're hitting, uh, struggling a little bit with uh, the kind of gap between the IT department and the rest of the organization. The organization, uh, yeah, working with money, for example. Yeah. Um, so that's where we came with this uh, final layer, and that's the services layer. So uh, we would try to make the architects uh, talk a little bit and work a lot more with the kind of services that would be guiding or helping the organization do whatever they want to do. And we, uh, we hosted those services in, uh, in API management. So just a quick example here. Uh, if we were Google uh, and creating Gmail, so Gmail would be a service that the uh, external people would be using, and you would have several system, uh, probably one like kind of spam classifier, I don't know, um, chat would be another one, UI would be another one, and, uh, and you can mix and match and, and, and replace them without breaking the consumers here. Also for each of the systems, we created a set of AD groups uh, to be able to control the kind of uh, um, access rights on the cluster. So they would have a developer, contributor, and a tech lead. A uh, tech lead would be one or two. Uh, the contributor uh, would be very, very few people, and that would also be linked to the, the subscription Azure. So if you're a contributor, you're also a contributor able to, to create resources in, in the Azure subscription. But the, the majority of people be uh, a developer, obviously. They would have read access to the subscription. And then in uh, Azure ID, you can also create these uh, aggregated groups. So all of the developers in each of the system then also definitely be a part of the HuffSnet developers AD group. Uh, yeah, and the tech leads as well. And this helped us a lot because um, before uh, upgrading, for example, to a new Kubernetes version, you can see that some of the APIs were getting deprecated. Previously, I would go about making sure that all of the deployments <laughs> would use that, and I could just hit an email to all the tech leads. They would be responsible for uh, upgrading each of the systems here. And those namespaces also gives you a, a lot of more control uh, on a lot of things. But the, the main part for us was the uh, constraints on the CPU and memory. So we would have cases previously with uh, applications with memory leaks, just taking down an entire node, eating up all of the memory. But you can also have other constraints here, uh, one being the number of load balancer, which we're going to touch about uh, a little later in the presentation. But uh, that's where you kind of avoid uh, the mistakes where the, a developer or myself would create a service of type load balancer and then exposing services uh, that you weren't supposed to expose. So in November 2018, roughly, uh, Kubernetes was in 1.9, and we're introducing a lot of um, the functionality that we did previously outside of the cluster, uh, cron jobs, for example. And we're a big HashiCorp fan, uh, so we use Terraform for spinning up all of the subscriptions and the resources there and using modules. So we use Terraform Enterprise for that, actually. And we're finishing up the migration, so everybody's taking through these kind of steps and, uh, and using the new, new platform. Moving on a little bit, uh, on the Ingress controller, you definitely want to have a clear Ingress co controller strategy. So this is where we are aiming at at uh, LCHIP. Uh, you want to definitely avoid just exposing uh, many Kubernetes services directly outside. You want to do it through an ingress controller. Well, it depends on your scenario, obviously. But in our case, we would then have two distinct ingress controllers. Uh, one picking up the ingresses that should be exposed to the API management, and the other one picking up the ingresses that should uh, make the uh, kind of single page applications and uh, regular web applications. Uh, and we also chose an, an Ingress controller that was kind of cloud native aware. So it would be uh, listening on the, on the API, API server for new ingresses and automatically conf configuring itself here. Uh, this was also a way to kind of centralize our control. So we spun up uh, a cloud provider DNS. 
So we used the Azure uh, DNS. So we used one internal, a, a private one, that the API management will be using for uh, hooking up and finding the uh, services on internal load balancer. And then we also use one external for, uh, for a couple of our domains. Um, Just to add to so that, that will be what we typically see in the industry is that uh, customer does sort of roughly speaking two things. So you have a Kubernetes cluster that has two services, one for internal load balancing and one for external load balancing. The external one is basically for all the ingress stuff that comes in and that's being handled as well. We also see a tendency that some customers, depending on how many clusters they want to administrate and, and what is basically needed, but a generalization of that fact is that we do see uh, spreading out a production cluster and don't mix the, the dev and test stuff with the production clusters, but have to two separate clusters, one for internal load balancing stuff and one for external uh, load balancing stuff. So it sort of depends on the scenario, but that's typically a pattern we sort of started to see. And, and, and we can easily do that as well. And also, um, one of the cool things about using a cloud provider is also that you have the possibility to uh, survive, let's say, outages locally in the data centers, but also having, let's say, a global footprint so you can start to scale into other clouds in other regions as well. So, so you need to be super unlucky. And it really comes down to how many bunches of nines you want to have at the end of the service that you're offering. And it could be an impact on, on what you basically sort of uh, are responsible for towards the business. We also saw with this uh, Cloud Power DNS that they, uh, the um, DNS request was much faster. And also the propagation was a lot faster as well. So we went from the kind of worst scenario where we have it seven hours waiting for propagation. <laughs> and on, on average, we were waiting just a couple of seconds on the on the NS. A big difference. Yeah. Monitoring, definitely a, a huge part. Uh, we wanted to centralize our logs uh, and also have a, a managed service. So we didn't want to, to uh, deploy the kind of uh, monitoring and, and log system in the thing that you're actually monitoring in and having alarms on in itself. So we decided to, to move on to, to log analytics on this part. Uh, it has uh, this uh, very powerful query language that you can use to kind of, uh, so we would definitely utilize that, save those queries, use it for troubleshooting later, and you can also export it, like we see on this picture, to, to, um, to Power BI. So we will cr be creating different Power BI applications for the different viewpoints of, from the organization. So the, the CTO would be interesting from one viewpoint on the logs, Developers, another one. CEO, definitely another one. And we're also making sure that each of the systems uh, would have this uh, dashboard set up as well, so that you can uh, kind of keep an eye on the overall health. And it's uh, easy to, to answer uh, questions from the architects, for example. And just a, just a quick one up. Uh, the, the sort of when you spin up a Kubernetes cluster, you have the option of adding a, a monitoring solution, which is a Fluent Bit agent. Uh, so we have the possibility to, to uh, do log collections of metrics and but also logs, and we shoot it into a repository that also resides in Azure, so you don't put additional load on the cluster itself. And Fluid Bit is also uh, known for being super lightweight, and we can actually also do uh, Prometheus scraping as well, if that's necessary. So that also just emphasizes the need of not putting additional load and keep your Kubernetes cluster as clean as humanly possible. Definitely. Uh, we were also utilizing the, uh, the alarms, for, because a lot of things that we were hosting was in, in Azure. And uh, picking up what uh, Gustav said, that you can have alarms uh, asking the logs, setting uh, and kicking off on, on certain thresholds, and those wouldn't be impacting the applications themselves. Um, so we would definitely be using those, having a naming convention and, and setting up a bunch of alarms. We are a big fan of uh, Azure monitoring for containers. So this is quite easy to get going with in the, in the AKS part which is just deploy on a, on a demon set. Is Can it readable? see something? Yeah, I just want to wonder. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that would be scraping. And we used it constantly to kind of um, fine tune the, the applications. So we see some of the applications would be throttling because we we're missing some CPU. With the top ones are using 100% CPUs. But you can also quite easily go back and see the trends over the last uh, three months, for example. 
and then we, we got a little bit uh, inspired uh, by how uh, the architecture of Kubernetes was as well. So we decided to create our own OpenID Connect uh, provider solution for all of the authentication and authorization. So previously it was a part of uh, each of the applications. We create some kind of custom way of asking if you have permissions to do this. Uh, you definitely want to do use a framework to, uh, to create an OpenID Connect uh, a valid solution, so we decided to use the identity server, which I believe is now coming as part of, uh, uh, some of it's coming part of the uh, .NET Core 3.0. Uh, and to make sure that this is the application level security, so we would be uh, uh, thinking more in the terms of API scopes and identity scopes. Uh, whereas it's quite easy to, to go into the trap where you're creating an API for one uh, uh, UI. We were flipping around and thinking more about the different APIs and, re and how they should go about re being reused. So that's where API scopes and identity scopes come into place. Uh, and we have just, in the .NET Core, you just hook in the middleware in the pipeline and, uh, and create your own policies based on the claims that are coming in there. So we will um, centralize that. So we have a, a, a few developers working on that project and also uh, spinning up the um, API scopes, identity scopes, and different uh, clients, and discussing with the teams how the flows uh, should, should be for those clients. It should definitely be different from uh, single patch applications than from uh, mainframe applications, for example. And now we were aggregating a lot of um, responsibility. So we decided to create this core team. Uh, so they would be responsible for spinning up the infrastructures uh, using Terraform. Uh, they would be uh, managing the CPU and memory for each uh, of the namespaces, and also taking a little more uh, holistic view of the, all, of, all of the systems. Um, so. What are we working on today? What are we excited about? <laughs> <laughs> well, a, a lot of things. Uh, it's, Kubernetes is moving incredibly fast. There's a lot of cool technologies coming out. But uh, definitely it's something that we're working uh, a lot with that uh, LCHIP is the security part here. Yeah. It's a bit different in the, in the cloud native environment from, uh, from on-prem. So you need to think about it a little bit different as well. It's, it's, it's super interesting to see how fast the pace of Kubernetes is going. Even as a person as me, who works a lot with it also from the, let's say our background wise, the uh, development side of it, is that it's just going incredibly fast. Uh, and it's also hard to keep up of it. And, and there's a lot of concepts, a lot of ideas. Uh, Windows being introduced now as well. So there's a lot of uh, sort of approaches that needs to be considered on how you want to be doing this. So uh, and this is a sort of a good example in this slide that we talk about. If you start bringing in container code, you also want to make sure that it's not compromised, the packages is, is trustworthy, the code has been signed off, and how are we going to be doing the scanning of images? Uh, and also now we're going to be running some of these images on maybe a virtual machine that's hosting the application as well from a container perspective. So there's a lot of considerations on how we want to be doing uh, this. So there's, of course, there's two big vendors. There's others out there as well. But we see a tendency that these are, are by far the, the biggest ones out there. And, and they do some pretty interesting stuff about catching malware inside of, uh, of these containers. So be careful about which images you start, of start playing around with and make a secure repository where you start uh, trusting all your own images and, and, and lock stuff down so you can only use specific images. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, how to do that. So, so when you're creating your Docker file, the, you're getting a lot of image layers and also getting a hash. So the, the thing that Aqua and, and Twistlog are doing is having a huge database with those hashes and to see if it's a vulnerability issue. So we will be hooking that into the CI/CD pipeline for the newly created images, but you definitely want to have kind of a notifications if one of your applications that are currently running has new known vulnerabilities as well. Uh, I think Aqua and Twistlock both have, have that functionality. So in this case, um, when you're doing in uh, uh, the architecture in, in Kubernetes control plane here, is that you're having a, a API server where each of your, uh, when you're using kubectl, you're going through a series of steps here. You're having the uh, authorization uh, and then the um, 
no, sorry, the authentication and then the authorization, which we touched upon. Uh, but you also have this admission controller, and that's the final step. Uh, and the way it works, that you can actually hook into this uh, HTTP request endpoints. So you basically say to Kubernetes, for all of the um, uh, JSON or YAML files, and then serialized.json coming in, so let's say a deployment, uh, you can say to Kubernetes that send it this endpoint, and I'll send you a request back uh, with the mutated JSON. And you can also hook into another endpoint that, that you're validating it and, and, and um, making sure that they have some, some rule set. So instead of creating all those checks yourself, there's a lot of community projects, one the most prominent and one being an open policy agent. So this is uh, kind of based on a Rego uh, query language. So it would be uh, able to set up rules here and we would be able to have a policy as a code. So just as Terraform has infrastructure as a code, you can now embed all of your policies. So instead of having Confluence pages or, or other uh, repositories, you can now embed it as a JSON or YAML. So you can enforce um, such policy I just made those up. Uh, all deployments should have a, a label with a tech lead email, for example. Uh, and the admission controller will then stop all of the new deployments that don't have this uh, set on it. Another one could be that you need to have uh, requests and limits to, to help the scheduler in, the, um, in Kubernetes to, to schedule the pods. Uh, there's other way of enforcing actually that one, but uh, you can do it in the mission controller, definitely. And this is the other one, so you can, in, you can uh, provide data as well. So you can have a kind of list of uh, the tech lead emails that should be present in the YAML file. And you can have deployments that specify a priority level between one and three. And that could be quite helpful if you're having troubles with one of your nodes. You can note, so you can easily do a, a, a command and then scale down all of the replica sets with, uh, with priority level three to, to make room for the ones having priority level one to keep your most um, promising up and running. Is that me? Yep. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so, so one of the things we're actually doing as well is actually sort of um, uh, some of the work we actually done on Azure as well is that we have something called Azure policies. And that's basically based on the same uh, source of, uh, of Gatekeeper, which is originating something that was started out of Microsoft. But that code was had, had, uh, handed over to the, um, the open source community. And it's basically just an example about that we want to control what basically your developers are pushing out. Uh, so when you deploy something, we'll also be making sure that it has a tag, it has an email included to it. And this is just an example of how I basically go ahead and do a, a Kubernetes a, a band image tags, and it floats away all the way into the constraints of my template that I see ro uh, running in here. So it's a cool way of doing a lot of cool stuff, and you can extend it to a lot of different kinds of ways. Uh, everything for authentication, spinning up stuff, you cannot push uh, code in if you haven't done any specific things. So it's a cool way of making sure that, that there's some consistency and security. Um, you're probably going to talk about the uh, security stuff and administ administrators now. So, so if you here in the audience are also uh, concerned about security, well, you can actually tell your security officer that might not have the, let's say, the, the knowledge around how to handle security from a container perspective, but this is a pretty cool way of doing it uh, in the future. So the thing we're looking at, in addition to all this, is uh, pod security policy. This is uh, maturing now. Uh, it's an admission controller, uh, like we talked about. And this is cluster level resources. So, resources, so it's something that the cluster administrator are spinning up. So it's uh, basically accept acceptable pod conditions. And then Kubernetes will then try to match a, a um, pod security policy and, uh, and enforce that. So we have one example here. I'm just going to zoom in if yeah. it's, uh, it makes it a little bit better. Yeah. yeah. So, in, cool. so in this case, we're saying that allow privilege escalation is set to false. So it's quite easy to... Important. It's quite easy to, um, to do a pod escape. 
have the containers jump outside of the pods and then go out to the to the host, for example. So, so just just to make that 100% uh, clear, if this was set to true, that means that the container yeah, you were running, let's say if, if it had a malicious uh, user in there, they would be able to jump out of that and do a lot of other malicious stuff on the host, for example. So. For example, you can have uh, all this security set up in your service mesh, but if you're just jumping outside on the node, you're kind of bypassing that. So that's uh, a lot of things Let's see if that we can you can pull, set. Can I? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No problem. Uh, so this is an example where you would be setting up on your one of the pods. And the Kubernetes will then see if the, the one actually is scheduling and creating that pod would have uh, the right have a secure, uh, pod security policy that matches this one. Um, another big thing is in networking policy. So we have the case, for example, um, uh, on previous customers where they have a lot of app services. And by just being app services, you have the constraints that they can't actually talk to each other directly and need to go uh, over the internet. So, so this is kind of a rules that you can say uh, what kind of communication is allowed. So this is just one example of a rule we had at, um, at Hofstadon, making sure that an application in one system can't directly call an application in another system. It needs to go through the, the right way. We need to use our own uh, APIs as well. So networking policies are uh, resources in Kubernetes, and then they are enforced by, well, by uh, a daemon sets, for example, in different projects. So the most, maybe the most famous one being Calico. Definitely. There are also uh, other cool projects uh, such as uh, Cilium doing eBPF, for example, instead of uh, IP tables. Service mesh. So finally, we're <laughs> arriving at service meshes here. Uh, so there's a lot of things that we can do before we arrive at service measures. Um, we are looking at introducing it uh, for two reasons. Um, one being that we are terminating all of the uh, TLS at the ingress controller, so the communication by the applications on the cluster is actually unencrypted. So you can easily just listen on, on network, for example. An another one that I can introduce uh, kind of good retry logic and you would also get a, a nice view because all of the um, of the calls between the hubs, uh, the pods are doing going to kind of a proxy. So this is also used in the admission controller, uh, just injecting. Uh, for example, you could have a, a namespace saying that this should be, have auto injected enabled, and then have this linkedd proxy and have a init container as well, automatically injected in deployment. Setting up some routing tables, so all of the uh, traffic would then go to this uh, proxy and also go out of the proxy. So in the LinkedIn case, it also feed that into Prometheus, so you can have um, a good overview of, of your yep. dependencies. So during KubeCon, um, one of our core contributors in, in Microsoft actually and came up with this idea. And so what we typically see in the industry is that you either pick one service meshes. Everyone, there's a lot of fuss about service meshes and, 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 and been talking to customers and working with Kubernetes for the last couple of years. It's funny to see like, uh, that, that when you really, really push it, it's not all customers that actually does need a service mesh. Now, there's a lot of advantages about service meshes is that you can get it and it has a lot of, a lot of cool features, but you also, also add an additional load on your cluster. And I talked about earlier that we want to minimize the footprint that it actually has uh, in your cluster as well. So we want to keep that as clean as possible. So one of the ideas with, with the service mesh interface specification is that it sort of approaches the same specification as you do as an ingress controller, where you can sort of switch depending on who you want to be using, traffic, or you want to be using Nginx. You can easily pick and choose whatever you want to have. The hard thing is if you go full blown with one service mesh technology platform, it's pretty hard to sort of, let's say, uninstall and clean it up and, and figure out how you want to replace it one, with one or the other. So instead of we thought, what, why not just have a service mesh uh, specification that you can basically utilize and, and, and go with? And, and uh, luckily, um, some of the other uh, big vendors out there actually thought this was a big idea. So in cooperation with Briarowen, that we have HashiCorp, uh, Solo, F5, Red Hat, WeWorks, we basically uh, wrote that specification together. And what we came up for now, and, and we just sort of figured out we need to have something 
to at least test out to see if that's something the community would like to have, is we came up with traffic policies, telemetry, and data management being like sort of the biggest ones the customers would like to have and test out. So that's sort of the idea why we brought this out. So again, just to summarize it, just think of the service mesh interface as being something like you would think of how to utilize a, a ingress controller. Sort of the same principles behind the scenes. Yeah? Yeah. And I think we have a couple of minutes, or actually 10 minutes, for uh, Q&A. So if there are any questions. If you're too shy to ask questions, we're going to be standing around here as well yeah. for the next 10 minutes as well. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I, let me, uh, so, so the question is, uh, when you start Kubernetes, should you have a service mesh right away or should you wait with that sort of? Yeah. So I can take that. So we typically see that I wouldn't recommend a service mesh unless you have a really good reason why you should need one. And then well, I would challenge you two times to, to sort of fact check if you really, really do need one. A lot of the generalization, I'm just going to generalize on, on what I hear in the industry from customers I've been speaking to, that a lot can be solved by Kubernetes itself, and also stuff like uh, Calico, for example, or any policies that you want to have uh, would sort of solve the majority of the functionalities. Now, there are some exceptions that you want to have best of breed on some specific technologies. Well, that's sort of where the service mesh interface comes in, that you can just take this specific component from Istio or Linkerd or console and basically utilize that for that specific need that you have that is not native in Kubernetes. So, so my recommendation is that don't get close to service mesh before you know Kubernetes, because that will bring too much complexity, too much load on your, uh, on, your, on your Kubernetes. And the learning path, sort of what you saw, saw at the angle, is sort of uh, a good example of that in my, in my view. Yeah? Should I, should I take it? Or? Yeah, I didn't. OK. So the question is, how should we control uh, costs? We want to be migrating some application from on-premises and moving that to the cloud. And, mm. and how can we sort of do that? That's sort of summarize it? Good. Mm. So we well, l -Ship is a good example of that. Uh, I have been going through that uh, just for, for sort of a different angle, but a bit similar. What I typically see is that think about how you want to be running stuff. Um, and and do, a did, a, do a good consideration about how you want to have your test a deployment sandboxes and, and have that in one environment. And the, clock, and the cloud operator model comes with a lot of cool features. So you can use something like low priority VMs, uh, cheap uh, VMs, uh, t-shirt sizes as well. And you can easily use that for your dev and tef, let's say, services. If you want to go production, you need to select what, let's say, the t-shirt size that will fit your application. That means from a CPU perspective, from RAM perspective, from uh, H, uh, SSD disk perspective, networking capabilities as well. And you can easily, that can be a bit hard to figure out. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the hustle and like what was the uh, point of uh, how and the t-shirt sizes were also was a big one we discussed for a while as well. I think that has an interesting point. Yeah, so in, in half the case, they were already running a lot of uh, things in the, in the cloud as well yeah. uh, from the, from the get-go. The ones that they weren't running, was uh, non-cloud native where big applications that were running on-prem. Sure, sure. And there were also some security reasons also that some things, uh, they had some kind of requirements yeah. that need to be run on-prem. But so one of the cool things is also that you can consolidate a lot of stuff. So we have a lot of customers saying that we have a lot of applications running on-premises and we want to be shooting that into the cloud. But you shouldn't just do that just because. There should be like a good ben uh, benefit like behind it. And you get all the cloud benefits when you actually also do that, like consolidation, scale, uh, and performance. Uh, what do I know, right? Uh, so, so it's a lot of factors, and it's a hard question to answer with, uh, within this time frame. But, <laughs> but it's sort of a, what, that sort of summarizes the, the, the picture of which, what we typically see out there. Cool. Other questions? Three, two, one. All right. All right. Thanks, thanks for, for listening to us, and thanks for coming.